Okay, so welcome to the BOF on uh, LTO and IPA. Uh, so I hope to get some discussion going, but anyway, I prepared some boring slides to get you an idea of what was done and what uh, is going in the progress. So let's start with the slides. Uh, so what happened in last year, well, if it will work, uh, the thing thing is what happened is that uh, we released the GCC9, which I think in this respect is an important release because uh, we basically solved the scalability problems for a uh, higher quantity number of CPUs, which was uh, making me nervous for a while. And also, it was the first time we did some kind of serious retuning on the bigger uh, project, because I finally got able to be benchmark Firefox and get some uh, data which are uh, reasonably reproducible and I can trust them. Uh, but still, uh, one thing which is missing is a reasonable LTO benchmarking infrastructure because the spec is simply too small benchmark to uh, analyze this thing. And so far, I basically have Firefox. I'm watching the other applications, but I'm not able to benchmark them effectively. So if you have something big and you can benchmark it for me, I will be very happy. Uh, so uh, the first thing is that uh, uh, historically, we had a problem with uh, scaling to the higher number of CPUs because the bigger number of partitions you had, the more streaming happens. So this is uh, the amount of streaming happening in GCC 8 and GCC 9. And you can see that the GCC 8 default, because the number of partitions needs to be fixed, you know, it cannot depend on number of CPUs because otherwise the builds will not be reproducible, was defaulting to 32 partitions, which was based on the fact that the first CPU where I was testing the bigger builds was having uh, 32 threads. And I simply set it up because I liked it 10 years ago. And uh, I was not able to increase it because if I increased it, uh, the streaming was going up very suspensionally, and uh, I couldn't justify it on the normal setups like uh, notebooks with four threads uh, to be penalized by increasing the number, you know, the increasing the default for a higher number of CPUs. This is much better now, so we was able to go from uh, 32 partitions to 128 by default and still decrease the quantity of streaming. And the problem turned it out to be relatively simple, but uh, not obvious to me for years. Uh, the problem is that uh, when we are merging uh, types, uh, we ended up with a lot of type duplicates for the complicated structures. Like in GCC, we have RTO structure. The RTO structure has a lot of pointers, and depending on your uh, includes, some of the pointers have complete types, and the other pointers have incomplete types. And it turned out that we ended up with something like uh, 300 duplicates of the structure, which was having different combinations of complete and incomplete files, which is about the number of uh, source files we have in the program. And you know, duplicating the types has eventually duplicated everything else. So actually, I think this is a useful observation also for people working on debug info, because I think the DWZ has the same problem. So if the DWZ was used, uh, was modified to merge the types based on uh, ODR names, uh, it would probably see uh, similar reductions in, in the number of, of types. So this is uh, the first uh, notable change, which, was, uh, which makes me happy because I didn't know where the problem is and I was nervous about it for years. And uh, this is how it translates to the uh, parallelism. So this is showing the CPU uh, graph on my 64 CPU setup uh, building a Firefox Lipsool. Uh, this is uh, the memory usage, and this is uh, the same thing for GCC uh, uh, 10. So you can see that uh, the compilation got slightly faster. You know, this is uh, 350 seconds. This is also 350 seconds. But the difference is not amazing, but it's there. Uh, what's important is that uh, we decrease the serial stage uh, a bit. You know, every release I'm trying to decrease it more. And we got the memory usage down. So, you know, it's peaking on 7 gigs instead of 10 gigs. And this part is actually uh, the parallel streaming, which could be probably very easily turned into threat implementation. And this uh, peak should, uh, should disappear. Uh, anyway, still, uh, the clunk is fitting in something like uh, two and a half gigs. So we still can go to 50% of what we do right now. But uh, yeah, no. Uh, five gigs is better than, than 10, for sure. Uh, so this is, uh, this is for the scalability, and you can see that uh, you know, that's a little bit confusion from the talk about the parallelizing uh, Kimpl optimization. I think I found a mistake in the setup. You know, the LD flex was missing the LTO equals to 64, and therefore all the linking was happening serially. So 
you can see that uh, the parallelism is not terrible, actually. If you compare it with LTE, with uh, Clunk, uh, the compilation times are pretty much uh, the same, which I believe is on the next slide. So this is how the compilation times looks like. Uh, you know, Firefox has a special property that it's having a relatively small part implemented in Rust, but compile times, you know, the Rust is dominating a good part of the compilation process. So if I had a fully C++ application, I think the graphs would be more separated. You know, the, 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 you know it's, still, uh, it's still relevant data, but it's a little bit confused uh, by the fact that uh, there is too much of Rust uh, source code in the Firefox code base. So you can see that uh, the LTO is adding some overhead to the normal compilation, but it's not so bad. Uh, what's a little bit uh, worse is that uh, the debug info is really slowing things down very noticeably, and uh, more for us than for Clunk. So uh, generally, uh, generally, you know, the Clunk is uh, slower without debug info and faster with debug info, which uh, I attribute uh, partly to the fact that all debug info is better, uh, but also it's because uh, we do a lot of extra I.O. Uh, we are putting everything into assembly file, you know, we are pickling that assembly files into assembler, which is increasing the memory footprint, and there's a lot of data which is being copied uh, for not a very good reason. So if we implemented uh, the object files being output directly from GCC, which in LTO is actually easy because you don't need to integrate assembler and you don't need to look into GAS source code, uh, we would probably probably uh, reduce the gap. Uh, on the other hand also, uh, I have recently built uh, the Clunk 10, and it actually improved. Uh, so uh, if I build Clunk carefully with the profile feedback at GCC, it actually becomes faster by something like 15%. So yeah, I didn't include it in the graphs because I didn't have comparable numbers, but we have, we have the performance gap to bridge again this year. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the code size. Uh, there is a little bit of development. Uh, you can see that uh, the GCC uh, code size got bigger. Uh, that was a relatively late change which I made to the inliner defaults. And what I found is that uh, you know, the GCC inliner has a global cap on the unit grows. Uh, it allows for a given compilation unit. And if you have a huge compilation unit with LTO like Firefox, uh, then there is so many of inlining opportunities that the inliner starts on this cup very, very quickly. So even very small functions are not getting inlined. And I was simply not able to get a consistent performance, you know, comparing uh, LTO builds and non-LTO builds uh, without increasing uh, this limit. And I'm not very proud of it, but uh, that was the best uh, I could come with, and uh, I spent important part of this year experimenting with avoiding this, and I failed. So uh, it is a problem, but, uh, and it's also a reason why the GCC 10 got a little bit slower in the compilation time, because if you put, you know, 10% more code into your backend, it's working 10% longer. And uh, so there is a, yeah, there is a difference, but we are still producing uh, very noticeably uh, smaller binaries than Clunk does which I think it's important and it also pays back in the performance. You know, if you choose the right benchmark, like loading uh, 50 most popular web pages, uh, then the GCC build binaries are about 10% faster than Clunk, and I attribute it mostly to the, uh, to the code locality. So uh, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, the size developments, and uh, well, I, uh, let me see if I can do it because the setup is not optimal. I know I don't have a split screen. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see if I can get it here. Uh, this is uh, this is the Firefox uh, comparison of the GCC nine and ten, and you can see there are quite nice improvements in 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 quite many benchmarks. Uh, there are also some regressions, but they are conveniently all located at the end, which is not that I would put it that way. It just happens, so I don't need to show you this part of page. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and what I think is, uh, is a good news is uh, this responsiveness uh, benchmark, which is basically testing the speed of the Firefox response after loading these 50 popular pages. So it's a very good uh, benchmark for a large code that is very sensitive to this type of changes. So I think the uh, code locality has improved thanks to a little bit more of inlining. Uh, but yeah, there is still uh, quite a lot of, lot of performance which can be gained on these benchmarks. But yeah, we at least have a uh, you know, a consistent improvement between uh, between releases. Uh, this is just a quick uh, 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 quick uh, 
summary of, uh, of the specs performance, so uh, you get the idea how much you can expect from LTO. Uh, so you can see that uh, the LTO by itself is uh, getting more effective, like with uh, GCC7 it was only 2% of specs, and now it's, uh, uh, let's say, 5%, but with profile feedback it's uh, significantly more effective because uh, these two things are combining well together. So the news is that you know, if you are, want to build a serious distribution, you should build everything with profile feedback and give up on any res reproducibility of your builds. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's the way to go. And you will make me very happy. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, this is something like, uh, like I don't know, 10% uh, of performance uh, improvement for LTO and PGO together. I don't have PGO numbers, but uh, they are similar to the LTO ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we know about it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there, there are interesting problems in specs, yeah. But even, in, even ignoring this, you know, like on Firefox, we have a similar problem. It's training, it's rendering routines, and the rendering routines are specific for a given uh, instruction set. You know, there's SSC2 and SSC4, and then, you know, you get optimized only the version which was used on the train run, and not the version which you are running on your notebook. Uh, so uh, this is actually, you know, if you see the forwarding benchmarks, uh, you can actually see this, uh, you know, you can see that uh, the graphic related routines are, are slow on his, uh, on his tests because he's using different instruction set that we use for on the build bot. And of course, I don't think we are watching the instruction set of the build bot, so it depends what build bot you get, uh, you, you get different set of optimized binaries. So there are, yeah, there are problems. Uh, they could be solved one by one. Uh, eventually. So this is, uh, uh, this is the spec FP, so it's a similar uh, uh, spec int, you know, it's a similar situation. I was able to include Clunk because the Clunk is building, uh, uh, building specs. So you can see that the Clunk also gets about 5% from, uh, from LTO, which is uh, actually slightly more than GCC7 and slightly less than GCC10. Uh, one of the thing is that the Clunk is rerunning the all optimization pipeline, so it also gets some benefits for simply doing everything twice. And uh, with PGO, I think we do well, but I don't have a, I have a clunk numbers, unfortunately. Later, yeah. Uh, okay, so this is, uh, uh, this is uh, about the performance. The important things that uh, we have switched, uh, uh, switched uh, by default to LTO, which is mostly thanks to the Martin Liska. I'm uh, very grateful for it, because it's basically, uh, yeah, I think. <laughs> So basically, uh, it means that the LTO is no longer a benchmark joke, but it, uh, it has some real world users. And also the good news is that, you know, after I installed the first snapshot running LTO, my notebook didn't crash, everything worked, and I didn't even notice any difference. It got much faster probably, but I didn't notice that, you know. And uh, so it seems uh, there was actually less problems than we expected. Uh, Martin can probably give a summary, but my impression is that one of the bigger set of problems are the simple versioning, because we don't really provide a good way to do it with LTO. I plan to fix it. Uh, there are problems with the configure scripts, which was mentioning by Jeff. Of course, you get a different set of warnings. You, know, you get ODR warnings, and you get uh, different light warnings, which are much less uh, meaningful than before, but it was not very meaningful before either. Are there any other important problems you would mention? Yeah, you know, we, we, we have a checker that the static libraries doesn't contain LTO bytecode because uh, we don't want to ship it at the moment. And we had some miscompilations, which were mostly yeah, caused by the packages, but mm -hmm. we had to debug this. And I think it's about 100 packages which are not using LTO out of a couple of, uh, do you remember the actual numbers? Mm, so it's disabled for 50, 60, 70 packages, mm -hmm. roughly. Mm -hmm. and there are some questions from 12,000. So yeah, that's from a, yeah, yeah, zero percent of packages is failing. <coughs> okay, there are, uh, um, so uh, I, I can actually confirm my, our results on, uh, on Fedora are very similar to what you guys are seeing on SUSE. Um, mm -hmm. Same set of problems. Mm -hmm. uh, we have done, not done any performance numbers. We're mostly looking at what builds, what doesn't. And uh, again, we're, we're seeing the same stuff you guys are seeing, which is actually great. Mm -hmm. so, thank you. Did you use uh, minus O2 with LTO, or did you 
to test was minus of three as well. O2, yeah, it's a default flag. So I think if the if the package is rewriting O2 to something else, then uh, you get O fast. But uh, yeah, by default everything is O2. So it, yeah, that that was not changed. And uh, mm -hmm. is glibc on your exclusion list? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know there are packages which doesn't really need LTO, and I think glibc is one of them. To be honest. <laughs> Because it's a, it's a runtime thing which is heavily head optimized. So. Mm -hmm. I have a question on the spec with LTO. Mm -hmm. And we noticed that one particular benchmark, I believe, is Fortran. Mm -hmm. And we got a, a compiler ICE during the LTO time because of, a, I think, a structure, a variable it defined in both in Fortran and then C or something. Mm -hmm. So we got that. that but did I open for that? Has yeah, that yeah, yeah. There's a yeah. I actually I looked on the back yesterday. I fixed it, so I was sent the uh, send the patch. But it's not at least uh, it's not any any release GCC. That's the bug which I introduced uh, recently. Oh, so, so. you fix today or tomorrow? Yeah, I will fix it. <laughs> yeah, I will fix it today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's ready. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is uh, so. I hope that you know, given that we switched, and Red Hat will hopefully switch, then the others will switch too, and the LTO will become default, which was something we intended uh, in 2005. For <laughs> and it's good it happened, you know, 14 years later. So uh, yeah, that's a uh, uh, that's a good news for me. And uh, now we get to GCC 10. So there are some changes already in the trunk, uh, which. Uh, uh, basically, I was uh, slowly working on improving the type-based alias analysis, especially for C++, because there you can use the ODR, and you can get pretty precise uh, idea, you know, which types are same, which types are different across the compilation units. And I believe it's very important because, you know, the C++ programming style stores everything into memory and that loads it back, and there's not many handles uh, how to disambiguate these things. So I have a student working on uh, uh, on the IPA pass for Motref, which is using the type-based alias analysis in for as well. And I hope that seems to really be effective on uh, getting this type of garbage, like that you have a call section. In the call section, you call a destructor. The destructor gets the pointer to the object, and it's touch almost nothing because it's a destructor. But we don't inline it because it's called, and it's not pure because it touched something. And that makes everything uh, in that function to be uh, stored uh, before calling this destructor. And uh, this type of things uh, can be optimized out. So that's a basic, um, basic motivation for, uh, for this work. Uh, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time looking into inliner, hoping to get back the code size increase, which I failed. But I fixed a lot of things. So it's working better than before, but uh, not as well as it uh, ideally should. Uh, there is a wall program IPS array, which uh, Martin uh, Yambor was working on, and uh, there is a, a switch to the CTD compression, which Martin Liska did, which is nice because uh, it saves some of the time from the serial stage, because the serial stage finally got fast enough that the compression actually shows uh, by some percentage. And uh, we also uh, disabled uh, the repo files, which means that you will get colorful warnings out of LTO, and they will not come all on the end of the compilation, they will come during the compilation, which is actually pretty handy because the compilation is slow. We can also make a progress bar. You know. <laughs> and so that uh, there are very important improvements, like uh, colorful warnings and new ICES on the, on the type merging. Uh, there is, uh, uh, what else is already in the main line? Uh, you was mentioning something to me before. Yeah, you forgot. Anyway, okay, so uh, there is uh, uh, some things which are close to be finished. Uh, there's this Motref pass, which uh, of my student, you know, if he was not lazy, it would be done uh, half a year ago. Uh, <laughs> there is a retuning of O2, which I'm working on, and, uh, you know, I'm also lazy, but it's actually, yeah, it's a slow story. I will show some numbers. Uh, there is uh, uh, Martin Liska working on IPA ICF, which is one of the three bottlenecks of the serial stage. Basically, the serial stage is 30% inlining, which I should work on, but uh, I'm basically hit the point that if I want to make inliner faster, I will also make it harder to hack. Uh, and uh, because I'm not happy with uh, the output of the inliner, I want to fix it first and then make it faster. And these things uh, keep pushing back. So I hope to do it in this uh, stage one. Uh, 
There is uh, the, the the last bottleneck is uh, streaming in uh, the types and declarations, which is slowly improving because we stream less. But at some point, we will probably need to parallelize it, which is an uh, interesting problem by itself. And uh, there is a simple versioning attribute, which uh, uh, we need uh, to enable the couple more packages. And uh, there is a, a nice work by, by the Chinese group uh, on, uh, on uh, the IPA uh, propagation, which I hope will also improve the inliner heuristic. And therefore, I will solve the problem that the binaries are getting bigger. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, and I got some data on my inliner experiments. So after a lot of experiments, I ended up changing uh, four parameters. And uh, basically, uh, I have a ranges uh, which uh, are sort of meaningful. You know, the, the lower range is the range which I found that actually decreases the code size. And it decreases the code size relatively uh, substantially, like it's a 10% for the spec int without LTO. And still the performance is about the same, you know, it's... Uh, uh, actually, actually faster, and the upper range is uh, when I actually get uh, some reasonable speed up, so like about one percent for for the scores, but at the same time I get a uh, reasonable code uh, growth, especially especially with uh, uh, with LTO. So without LTO the code size is okay, but with LTO we we get uh, code growth, uh, and uh, one reason why I'm still not happy about this is that you know, it's possible to find a number in between which still be, makes uh, improvements and, uh, and uh, it doesn't uh, increase the uh, non-LTO binaries. Uh, but that was all basically motivated by Firefox, which uh, has really very small functions which are not inlined. And because the inliner is starving on this overall unit size growth, it never gets into these limits. So actually, you know, after all this work, I didn't change in, you know, the quality of the Firefox too much. Uh, basically, I decreased the uh, costs of some hints, and I got uh, something work better. But basically, uh, for very big applications, uh, the code is not uh, not really changing. So that's a little bit a uh, little bit disappointing on on this effort. But I hope to you know finish it and get some code size from the other options, like uh, decreasing the code alignment for O2, and being being able to to trade it uh, later. So that's uh, that's uh, basically the current uh, work in progress. And I can at least maybe quickly uh, show uh, some numbers. Uh, so this is uh, how the how this uh, aggressive and let's make it bigger because I even I don't see it. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the 16 hours is the uh, is the uh, conservative run, and this is uh, no no actually it's uh, yeah this is the aggressive run. So. Uh, uh, let me see if I can make sense of it right now. Uh, so basically, uh, the Cactus IDM is a benchmark which is noisy, but otherwise you get uh, kind of expected uh, differences like the C++ and Salang, you know, deal two, which are C++ heavy benchmarks are improving uh, by significant percentages. You know, a lot of the specs benchmark doesn't care because you know GZIP or you know they are too small to uh, and too hand optimized to really uh, be sensitive to this benchmark. Uh, so yeah, I have basically analyzed all the regressions, and I will probably push uh, push the changes uh, to the to the main line uh, next week because not that I would be fully happy, but uh, I think you know it should be mainline so it's get better tested on other architectures, and we don't do it at the last minute of stage one again. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, please yeah. jump in. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so my overall idea is to enable the inlining at O2 because I think it's essential for C++. You know, uh, do this initial set of tuning, which seems to be in the reasonable boundaries, and then keep improving it. Uh, and also, I want to look on the other uh, other optimization passes. You know, code alignment, uh, vectorization, and loop stuff. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, clearly you should all this. All the tests on x86. I mean, is there a way to try to ensure that this also has at least isn't uh, that doesn't cause degradations for other architectures, ARM, PowerPC, yeah, Make 390. Mm -hmm. If you check it, check it into trunk like in stage one. Mm -hmm. Then it certainly will be tested on, yeah, yeah. on PowerPC. And yeah, at the moment, yeah, we have a ARM benchmarking machine, but it's uh, relatively slow, so it's not easy to run the custom benchmarks on it. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, yeah. And we so the, we are basically lacking uh, lacking hardware, which will be solved by Jeff. So. <laughs> Okay, so this is uh, the end of what I wanted to say, and I guess we can start discussing. Uh, yeah, we still have about half of the half of the slot uh, to get some discussion done. So, mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at configure scripts mm -hmm. for unrelated reason. Um, is there something I should watch out for LTO compatibility um, or is the current idea that we will never do cross-project LTO uh, aware you, I mean, uh, they're, they're, they're historically uh, the, the configure checks are usually the link test, you usually have a fake prototype for a function and then call it and that, that's, that's undefined behavior if the mm -hmm. compiler knows what the function actually Yes, yeah. 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 Uh, well, yeah, I think the most uh, painful tests are those which are scanning assembly output because, uh, you know, if you get the pickled LTO in your output, then uh, the test doesn't find what it uh, does. But this kind of the usual tests which are doing, uh, you know, just calling the function to see if the function exists, those are working. So, yeah, there is some configure fallout, but not terribly bad. Uh, yeah, I guess Jeff and Martin has uh, better data. It's annoying because you know it's a lot of things to check and there are often old packages, but the, the biggest problem I see on the configure side, uh, at least for Fedora, is that we have packages that have configure scripts that were built by Autocon 15 years ago, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and and LTO just it just optimizes the whole thing away. Mm -hmm. um, with a modern Autoconf and a modern modern generated configure. It does work, so so it's it's a yes and no. If if Fedora was uh, capable of keeping all those things up to date, then then it, this would be a non-issue. But realistically, when I look, particularly at these really old ones, um, updating Autoconf and rebuilding them is simply impossible. It is probably going to be fixed with said. <laughs> yeah, that is my um, that was my experience as well. Basically, you can't uh, re auto reconf the stuff because it requires something that's not available to us anymore. Um, so, um, so my takeaway is that I don't need to look at the the the, the, mis the prototype mismatch issue. That it's not worth fixing that at this stage. I I don't know. I, I think it's it, it's about eight hundred to nine hundred packages yeah. total failure rate. But that is, that is the other thing for the implicit function declarations, right? Yeah. And yeah, I'm looking at that, fixing that, but uh, I was wondering if I should look at LTO, LTO issues at the same time, but I guess we can concentrate on, on the impl implicit function declarations mm -hmm. by themselves. I, if you run with the, the implicit function declarations, I'll run on the, the LTO configure stuff. Um, I think we can do that in parallel. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder if the if the autoconf can be teach to disable LTO for the tests. You know, that would make. Uh, yeah. If you're compiling config.c or. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. You can have a plugin to do that. Yeah, again. <laughs> no, no, no. That's not the right answer. It is not. <laughs> Long term, I wonder whether there are plans to be more integrated, you know, in terms of LTO through the math library, LTO through po parts of glibc. You don't want to do everything, obviously, but mm -hmm. when obviously when you're saying spec, there are two benchmarks that are very, very, very heavily tuned to the math library, and it may make sense to yeah. be able to pull three or four important math functions out of the math library. Yeah, actually, I think the the easiest target here is the lib Fortran. Uh, because it's shipped with the compiler and it has a stuff which definitely benefits from inlining. Uh, and there are some PR bugs which I'm aware of, which I need to fix to, to make this move forward and then hope it will happen. So. Okay, that was my question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I have patches for that too, but uh, yeah, I need to I need to upstream that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, at the moment. Uh, the IRL is not very stable, so it makes sense to ship it for a small set of uh, carefully chosen 
library is scikit lib curve for G Fortran can be the first one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I was reading one of those Fortran bug reports. I think it said something like the library and the main program had to be compiled with the same set of options. Uh, Maybe that's yeah. just not true. I don't know. Uh, well, there is a yeah, there is a surprises to hit when you when you compile by different options. Basically, what we do is that you know we assign the options to the function, and it all works well unless you want to inline. And of course, you want to inline, and then the function is getting from one set of the options to the other set of options. And we have a very partial, pretty lame set of checks which are saying yes, the function can be inline, or no, the function cannot be inline. So yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have very good answer to that. So, uh, actually, yeah, the, like the main problem which I'm facing on on the Firefox is that if you have a big project with multiple set of options and you have the com dots, uh, then you know what happens is that we do very minimal inlining on the on the compile time. Then we get to the link time. You know, one of the versions of the com dot wins, and the others gets discarded, and that has one specific set of options, which is usually OS for uh, Firefox. And then this one gets inlined everywhere or blocked everywhere. So you are getting very, very unreliable inliner uh, decisions uh, in the context of mixing uh, optimization flux. So I'm, I'm trying to track this uh, together with a simple versioning uh, by being able to load multiple versions of the bodies uh, to the compiler and then choose the one which is compatible. But it has a lot of uh, funny consequences because the body needs can, can use different kinds of symbols and and so on. So you know there is some uh, some checking which needs to be done. Plus, it's uh, confusing in liner metrics. Uh, here, I have a question about the compile time. So all of your data are based on x86 architecture, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, one of our findings, uh, it might be uh, different on our other hardware architectures, mm -hmm. like x64. I don't know uh, if it is. Might be some reasons behind this. Yeah, it would be nice to to report. You know, if I if I had such cases to look on, I will I will be definitely doing that. Uh, you know, I'm I'm checking uh, the things which I can build on my machine because it's easiest for me. And as Firefox, right. LibreOffice, uh, sometimes Chrome, Meum, uh, and the other things, yeah, you know, definitely you can hit various bottlenecks because it's a complicated set of algorithms. So it would be nice to know about them and report them. Okay, thanks. Did you turn on LTO for 32 bit architectures as well? Uh huh. Martin? <laughs> so no, no, no extra fallout. So we basically enable it for all what we support, which is currently x86-64, ARX-64, or PC-64, and S390X. Well, that's all 64-bit. Yes, we, we, we still have... We It sounds like it sounds like something I should just queue up and, and just yeah. do mm -hmm. uh, when we're done some of the other stuff. Yeah, so I I'll, think I'll do uh, it and send you a link to it. Yeah, I think you will end up hitting problems with uh, projects of the large scale of Firefox. But actually, you know, building Firefox on the 32-bit architecture needs hacks already. So you know, we are hitting the problems already. And uh, so I think actually it's built by with uh, minus G1 and so on. Uh, so yeah, the 32-bit you know, architectures should die. I <laughs> know, uh, no, no. Actually, I'm happy to keep uh, decreasing the footprint, so it's good to have some goals. <laughs> uh, for the uh, LTO of parts of the math library or libg Fortran, it might be nice to have some hybrid linking module where we. Uh, for, for the LTO purposes, for inlining and for function cloning, just use the static library, but if, if we just decide we want to use the original function without changing, then we would defer to, to the dynamic library, but I guess yeah. on the linker side, it would be terrible too. <laughs> uh, yeah, we will need uh, 
plugin extension for that. But yeah, it, uh, I was thinking of it a little bit. And yeah, the, the main problem is that at the moment, you know, it's the linker deciding which version of the body to pick. And once it picks it, you know, it looks on the dependencies, you know, it looks what functions it is calling and it picks uh, the bodies recursively. So, you know, you cannot really change uh, the decision from the compiler because you don't have the functions which you need uh, already uh, anymore. So, yeah, that would need some uh, some kind of communication between compiler and, uh, and linker, which is significant change to the plugin interface. So, yeah, yeah, we have other problems of this type, you know, like if you want to invent a new hidden symbol name, we have no safe way of doing it without possibly clashing with something uh, elsewhere which we don't know about. So, yeah, there are some, some plugin extensions will be needed, even though it works pretty well. Uh, yeah, so to expand on what Jakub said, uh, can we imagine having a section in the dynamic library that stores some summaries of the uh, functions in that dynamic library that could be used for like analysis phase, uh, for example, that the function is pure and so on. Mm -hmm. Not storing the body of the function in, in the dynamic library, but just some, some small summaries. Uh, I'm concerned that uh, and it, it, whether the function is pure or not is basically an accident of the current implementation and then you change ABI uh, once you rebuild the shared object and you get basically yeah. subtle breakage. So it would have to be explicit, I think. Yeah, yeah I agree. You know, it's uh, basically the summaries which we are making, they are pretty friendly to be pickled you know, out of the LTO word and used. Uh, but uh, then, yeah, you need to deal with this problem that, uh, you know, if you change the library, you know, you change the implementation, and these summaries will change uh, in a random ways. And uh, you will need to somehow, uh, somehow deal with that. So I'm not sure how many shared libraries we have, which we are willing to rebuild everything which is using them at any time we change them. So, yeah. My uh, so <laughs> yeah, my, yeah, my case, <laughs> so uh, for, for uh, if the problem I see is that also uh, until the LTO representation is stable, you basically uh, have to rebuild the libraries mm -hmm. once you upgrade GCC, and that that is also not something that's comparable with how we build our distributions. So yeah. it might be different for others, and I wonder if we should put in source code fragments into. Yeah the library instead so that yeah. we have a stable serialization. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, what we do is that we are basically disallowing any IL in the in the final RPMs uh, and there's a checker for that, right? So yeah, we simply do LTO inside of the package but not across uh, packages. That's the current policy which I think it's it's okay. Well, except for the compiler runtime, like the libg Fortran, I don't see problem with that because uh, you ship it together with the compiler anyway. But yeah, in other cases uh, that would be a problem. I think Jeff already mentioned the problem with WL not getting passed to uh, uh, the LTO stage or not being affected, uh, effective in the uh, during the LTO stage. If mm -hmm. you've overcome that even in, in your experiments, do you have any feedback or any insight into uh, how effective the middle end warnings are during LTO? I mean, are we finding more issues? No, no insight or you haven't enabled, uh, overcome the, the WL problem yet? Not solved yet? Yeah. Okay. Well, my experience is that if I'm watching compiling Firefox and I get these middle end warnings, uh, yeah, they are noticeably more confusing than uh, than before. So, you know, we have all the set of problems that we are outputting warnings on the clones and we are not really telling user that this is the clone and not the original function. And, uh, you know, you see these problems much more pronounced with, with uh, LTO because we do more cloning. And also, you yeah, know, we are outputting uh, types and everything in this kind of simplified C form which is not very easy to map to the original in many cases. So yeah, it's far from optimal, but I guess uh, we will simply have to deal with that one by one. Or, yeah. or, or remove all the light warnings, you know, that would be a nice answer too. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so are you saying you get warnings that happened for the clone but didn't happen for the original function? Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah. 
So we shouldn't learn about it at all. Yeah, but then, of course, you know, sometimes we throw away the original function and then we forget about the warning. Right, right. So, yeah, you really get many, you know, you get all this uninitialized warning on the uh, fields of the structs, which are yeah. uh, already outputted very troublesome right. by so, and so, yeah. So what you're saying is uh, it's a problem because uh, you should warn about the original function, yeah. but that's thrown away. And right. yeah. Uh, it's actually, I think it's interesting to look into bigger projects like uh, Firefox or Chromium. You know, they are building with we all, but they disable a very large set of warnings because they simply given okay. up on uh, fixing them. And I think we can use it as the feedback and try to, you know, get them less uh, less annoying. So like, yeah, this we all on the on the SR8 structs, you know, that they are very hard to parse even for me. So I guess uh, they are completely lost for a normal developer. At least that's my impression. Mm -hmm. So the uh, the spec benchmarks you have here, some really important ones are degrading quite a bit. Like the uh, uh, Perl band is degrading a whole lot. Uh, buff rate, it's almost out of the skin. Yeah. It's degrading quite quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, is that gonna gonna be fixed still for stage one? Mm -hmm. Is it? Is, will that be fixed in stage one still? Uh, yeah, well, uh, the regression of the cactus, uh, I'm convinced, is uh, just randomness to the care tester. About uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I did, uh, yeah, I did uh, some, uh, yeah, I analyzed some. Uh, I uh, analyzed uh, parallel. I given up on the cactus because I'm not able to reproduce it, and I think it's oh. just a fancy tester. Uh, I also analyzed some things like uh, there is a huge code regression on GCC, which is easy for me to understand. Yeah. And then I know what the inline array is doing. You know, the inline array is basically picking all the predicates we have which are caught by these auto-generated functions many times. And because the predicates are very relatively cheap checkers, which optimize for the given context because they are receiving the constant mode parameters, the inliner think it's very cool to inline them. And it's doing a lot of job on this, and then it increases the GCC binary by 25%. And maybe, you know, it will get pattern matching faster, but uh, it's very hard to tell the inliner not to do that because it really looks like a very reasonable transformation locally. Because if you have all this pattern matching, if we inline it, you optimize it very well. So yeah, th those are hard cases. You know, it's a uh, it's a slow uh, process. Like, uh, all the green ones look really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the red, red ones the doesn't red look. Ones yeah, yeah, yeah. Look so nice. I know the feeling. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, I analyzed. Uh, yeah, there, there are some which I already fixed, so they don't show. Uh, yeah, and. Um, I don't remember the situation with Perl, to be honest. Uh, I will, yeah, I will probably profile them and uh, do some work on it. Mm -hmm. A different question about the symbol versioning problem. Um, that's a fallout from the general problem related to ASM top level statements. And I wonder if it would be useful to have uh, the ability to attach a uh, top-level ASM statement to a function declaration so that you get yeah. the DSM sta uh, statement is expanded in each translation unit that uh, or it's mm -hmm. uh, each partition that uh, references the function. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, there is some work on this done on, uh, mm -hmm. on the clunk because they are able to parse the ASM statements and they are able to find the symbols which it defines and then also they don't do the partitioning actually, you know, they keep Basically, the original original file layout. Uh, so yeah, uh, I was thinking that yeah, you know, if we want to get this work, uh, we need to be able to get some kind of uh, you know, like we have input and outputs for the statement level the same statements. You know, we need to we need to declare you know what symbols are defined by the statement and which symbols are used by the statement. And mm -hmm. we need to add some way to, for compiler to be able to rename them because sometimes you need to put this uh, LTO prif uh, suffixes. Oh, so you will have, yeah. you know, yeah, you will need to extend uh, the ASM uh, syntax relatively a uh, lot. Which, yeah, I don't know if it needs to be done. You know, it's not fun. That's why yeah, it's not I, done. We have a, uh, uh, on the GLIPC side, not that I mm -hmm. think we can enable LTO anytime soon, but mm -hmm. we have some cases where we use. Uh, Top-level ASM statements, not for symbol versioning, but for yeah, some yeah. other stuff that yeah. that's symbol related, mm -hmm. and that what might yeah, be yeah. used by other packages. One well. thing you know, which I do, you know, if if I uh, see the ASM statement in the, I uh, just disable LTO for that module, and you know, if you put the ASM statement separately and you disable LTO for them, or you put them to ASM file, you no, know, things are working pretty well because. Uh, 
then GCC sees it as a non-LTO word and it will behave to it uh, rationally because it will go through the symbol table. Yeah, I think we have a top-level alias uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, set pseudo-instruction that uh, creates a local alias for the stack check fail function or something like that. Yeah, and yeah. that would, uh, with the automatic uh, switch off, it would it essentially disable LTO for the entire yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, project. So. Yeah, well, we have alias attributes, so we don't, yeah, you know, these things which are affecting the symbol mm. table, like symbol versions and attributes and aliases, yeah. uh, they need to be represented in the way which ECC understands, you know, and the top level ASM yeah. statement is not the you know, most beautiful way to do it. Yeah, I th uh, but if you use. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and but I this is possible to do with uh, aliases. You know, that's uh, I think I designed you know the new representation to you, get it working. If you use top level ASM, you almost always have to use no top level reorder. So you could, mm -hmm. could yeah, you yeah. could just key out of uh, key from mm -hmm. that. Yeah, and even that is not completely safe. You know, when the it's translation unit gets partitioned. So yeah, that's uh, it's a ugly ugly yeah. area, uh, which yeah what something should be done about. Uh, is there a requirement that an alias attribute uh, refers to a defined function? I think that y used to be the problem in the past. Uh, that, 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 that you have to have a, lo a, a de definition in the, in the same translation unit before you can that's use the alias. Uh, yeah. It's and not required in the, in the middle of the implementation, but yeah, you are probably right that GCC is actually verifying it, which I didn't change because I didn't know it's a problem for someone. So yeah, yeah. And that's mm -hmm. why we use the the, the 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 assembler injection in some cases mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. then we don't have that problem. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it might be useful. You know, maybe if we get into touch and we we somehow mm -hmm. you know see what kind of uh, if ASM statements are needed and uh, we think of uh, yeah uh, the ways sure. to to solve this. Because yeah, you know, getting the ASM statements works in general is almost impossible. You know, we, we would need to understand all of the statements that are often fragments of something, you know, which is meant to work in context and and they are very fragile. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, have you tried to add LTO to the bootstrap? The last stage. Uh, well, I'm bootstrapping with LTO, all my LTO related changes. You know, we have LTO bootstrap. And we are also bootstrapping it for the distribution. So we do the profiled and LTO builds of GCC, which make it faster. Uh, yeah. So actually, uh, that's one thing I observed, that you know, if you compile Clunk with profile feedback, and you get it right, and you get it with GCC, then the Clunk really improves a lot. Because uh, they are suffering from the binary size much more than we do. Uh, so yeah. Without profile feedback, you know, the compile time data looks much better for us than with the profile feedback. <laughs> uh, I have a problem. That's a long-standing issue with uh, RTO driver. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you turn, when you RTO, there's no way you can pass the assembler option to the assembler. Mm -hmm. Dash WA does not work with mm -hmm. RTO driver. Mm -hmm. Will that's the long has been the bug has been opened for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Will that be eventually fixed one way or the other? Well, I don't know. Actually, I didn't know about this bug, and I never tried to pass any parameters to assembler, so I was always happy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah, we need to look into that. Yeah. Uh, so the problem is that it doesn't get through the through the plugin, and uh, yeah, there's no easy way to specify options which no. the plugin should recursively. Uh, I see where it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> so, no more. You know. Well, we are actually almost running out of time anyway, so we can declare LTO to be finished and perfect. <laughs> and. <laughs> And then we will look into a couple of those issues because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, actually, yeah, yeah, the, the the ISM statements is something we should uh, we should track. So, mm -hmm. okay, so thank you. <laughs>